The film opens in the 15th century on a battlefield engulfed in chaos, where every man is locked in a desperate struggle to vanquish his foe. The air is thick with the sounds of clashing swords and the cries of the wounded as blood and gore fill the area. The setting shifts and we find ourselves in open fields, where a band of men urgently gallop their horses. After hours of relentless travel, they reach the kingdom of Kochi and offer the head of their adversary to the ruler. Delighted with the present, the king convenes with his counselors to discuss their predicament. Advised to strengthen the kingdom's ties with Portugal, as they cannot prevail against the Zamorans without their support, the king contemplates the weight of their counsel. Agreeing with his people, the king sends for the Portuguese ambassador. Beyond the castle walls, the spice merchants express their dismay at the shifting alliance between the Portuguese and Kochi, as well as the new requirement for tax receipts to conduct trade. They indicate that the funds they would be obligated to pay to the Portuguese would significantly diminish their profits. The merchants go to speak to the king who is watching General Alfonso of the Portugal army train his men. Taking them inside the tent, the king inquires why they have come over. The elder and most influential merchant breaks the ice by telling the king about his son, Mohammed's, engagement and receives approval from the king. He then breaches the subject of starting a new relationship with the Portuguese when they had initially promised the Arabs their business. The king adamantly explains that he had made this decision for the safety of their land and that he cannot go back on his word. Later, the merchants have a meeting, and the elder, Marakar, suggests an alternative to sell to the Arabs by putting their spice in small bags and transporting them on fishing boats. That evening, the group gathers around a fire and begins to speak about the past war, Marakar sadly recounting the one he lost his son in. In his chamber, Mohammed reclines on his bed as his mother recounts the story of his father's demise and Marakar's subsequent surrender after witnessing his son's death, symbolized by laying down his sword before the king. That very night, Muhammad's mother had taken the three-year-old Muhammad and followed Marakar to the city, where they embarked on a new path as spice merchants. Several days later, as they commence their clandestine trading activities, Marakar falls victim to betrayal at the hands of his brother-in-law, Moidu, who seeks to gain favor by aligning himself with Alfonso. Unaware of the treachery, Marakar leads hundreds of his people to his daughter-in-law's residence to celebrate his grandson's wedding. Upon their arrival, a grand celebration ensues, with all the guests feasting and reveling well into the night. Later, under the cover of darkness, Muhammad clandestinely slips out to rendezvous with his betrothed and childhood friend, Aisha. Using their secret code sound to summon her, the two slip away into the moonlit wilderness, playfully running and enjoying each other's company. Suddenly, an unseen pullet pierces through Aisha's head, causing her to fall into his arms. Shocked by the incident, he tried to wake her up, but her face was covered in blood and she was unmoving. Gunshot begins to fill the air as Portuguese soldiers massacre his family. The once happy environment is now full of screams. Mohammed arrives just in time to witness the horrifying spectacle, but his uncle Patu restrains him from intervening. They cower in hiding as they witness Moidu dragging Mohammed's mother by the hair and presenting her to Alfonso, who callously slits her throat. After the soldiers depart, Mohammed rushes to his mother's lifeless body and weeps at her feet. Upon returning to the city, Moidu fabricates a tale of internal conflict, attributing it to a misunderstanding regarding the requested dowry. Now at the helm of the Marikar family, Moidu assumes a leadership role among the merchants and assures them that he can eliminate the taxes imposed by the Portuguese. However, he sternly warns them against further trade with the Arabs. Meanwhile, Mohammed and Patu have made it back to the city and are seeking the treacherous Moidu. They finally find the man walking in the city streets with his followers and assassinate him in broad daylight. Having been seen by the guards, Patu and Mohammed are forced to flee, maneuvering their way through the chaotic market. After eluding the guards, the two men discover a raft and endeavor to flee the kingdom by sea. However, they soon encounter a fierce storm, rendering it impossible to navigate the raft effectively. Following hours of battling the relentless winds, the raft capsizes and the raging waves engulf them. As he regains consciousness, Muhammad discovers himself sprawled on the shore. Upon venturing into town, he encounters his uncle seeking sustenance in a mosque, and the two joyfully embrace, grateful for their reunion. They contemplate beginning a new life in this unfamiliar land, and Patu presents his nephew with a sack of money to help him establish a business of his own. Inspired by his uncle's words, Muhammad begins work as a swordsmith, setting up his stand inside the market. Following the havoc wreaked by the storm that led Muhammad to the fisherman's town, the villagers receive donations from their ruler, intended to be distributed by the landlord named Namathu. However, Namathu, driven by greed, attempts to sell the grain and rice for profit. When confronted by Patu, 
Namathu retaliates by having his men assault him. That very night, Mohammed and his newfound allies take matters into their own hands and steal from the greedy Namathu, intending to distribute the food to the townspeople. The bandits take up residence in the woods, persisting in their efforts to provide sustenance to the people, shielding them from oppressive rulers and living as outlaws. Years later, the now well-organized bandit group had become a force to be reckoned with and was feared by every wealthy man and ruler. The grievances of the rich reach the ears of the supreme commander, Mangatachan, who assures his people that he will apprehend the bandit group, now known as Kunjali. However, he acknowledges that the group's leader has garnered respect and affection from the populace. Achuthan, Mangatachan's older son, swears to the landlords that he will apprehend Kunjali by the end of the lunar moon. Away from the city, the bandit group encounters a Portuguese ship, and bandits manage to get control of it, killing the members and taking the goods along with a Chinese slave which they start to call Chinali. After Muhammad shows him kindness and reunites him with his mother, who was also on the ship, Chinali saves his life from a traitor on his crew. In the following days, the Zamorin ruler accompanied by Mangatachan and other officials received a letter from the Portuguese explaining his disappointment about refusing to accept his conditions, threatening to send his soldiers if they didn't do so in a few days. Later, when they're alone, Mangatachan's younger son, Anandan, proposes that they recruit Kunjali to help them win the war against the Portuguese. Mangatachan presents his son's suggestion to the council, and the king approves it. Upon accepting the invitation, Mohammed, accompanied by Patu and Chinali, arrives at the palace, where many countrymen assemble to witness the living legend. It is disclosed that Patu and Mangatachan had previously battled the Portuguese, and Mohammed is revealed to be the last heir of the Marakar family. Honored by their guest, the king names Muhammad the commander of their navy, taking the position from Achuthan, who immediately holds a grudge. The decision creates controversy amongst the lords of the city, and some decide to refrain from the fight, deeming themselves as cowards and choosing to survive. On the day of the Portuguese navy's anticipated arrival, Muhammad orchestrates an intricate trap that catches them off guard, resulting in the sinking of most of their ships. Following a fierce and devastating battle, Muhammad succeeds in slaying Alfonso and securing victory for his people. When Muhammad and his people return to the castle, they are hailed as heroes, and Muhammad's family honor is reinstated, elevating him to the status of a nobleman. Despite feeling anger and resentment towards Muhammad's triumph, Achuthan finds himself captivated by Arka, the daughter of a minister who has also gained the attention of Chinali. Upon receiving his ancestors' land, Muhammad embarks on the task of renovating the dilapidated buildings and establishing his village. Meanwhile, despite Achuthan's affection for Archa, she has developed feelings for Chinali, and the two lovers spend their time together. Hoping to make his brother feel better, Anandan speaks to Archa's family in hopes of having her marry Achuthan. Finding out that her parents have agreed, Archa is devastated and fears losing the man she loves and flees with him. The following day, Archa's father and Achuthan barge into Muhammad's village and demand to see Chinali as they think he has abducted Archa. Promising to put the man on trial if he is found guilty, Muhammad urges them to leave. A few minutes later, one of the women reveals that they have been hiding in the community all along. Archa tells Muhammad that she was already with a child and that she came there of her own volition. After hearing their truth, Muhammad allows them to go to the palace and explain their situation. As they prepare to depart, Anandan and Achuthan approach them to speak with Muhammad. Upon seeing Arka, Achuthan becomes consumed by rage and attacks her, prompting Chinali to defend her. Tragically, during the altercation, Chinali is killed, leading Archa to take her own life out of grief. Muhammad, delayed by his prayers, arrives in time to witness his friend's death and, in a fit of anguish, retaliates by killing Anandan. That night, Mangatachan comes to Muhammad's house and begs for his son's body so he can bury him properly. After hearing the truth that Chinali's death wasn't Anandan's fault, Muhammad pleads for forgiveness for his actions which were born from anger. Once he performs his son's final rites, Mangatachan decides to depart. As a result of his actions, Muhammad is branded a traitor and summoned to court to face his sentence. On his way back with a response, the messenger is assaulted by the conniving Achuthan, who alters the letter Muhammad had sent to further solidify his traitorous reputation. His plan unfolds just as he wanted. Achuthan is made regent of the kingdom, a conspirator of the king who has been working with the Portuguese supporting him. As his first action, Achuthan allows the Portuguese to settle into the country, submitting to their rule. After being informed that an impending attack is coming to his door, Muhammad rallies his people and the countrymen to stand with him. A few days later, Muhammad's forte becomes encircled by Portuguese armies who have completed their preparation to attack, 
Muhammad rides out with two of his men to speak to the Portuguese general, Da Gama, who flaunts his giant army in Muhammad's face and urges him to surrender before it is too late. Insulting Da Gama and threatening that he would end his life if he entered his forte, Muhammad returned to his line with a fierce determination to defend his territory. As the battle commenced, Muhammad's meticulous preparations and strategic placement of traps proved to be effective, causing significant damage to the 1st and 2nd battalions of the Portuguese forces. The chaos and confusion so by these traps initially gave Muhammad's army the upper hand. However, the Portuguese refused to be deterred by the setback. They unleashed the thunderous roar of their cannons, unleashing a relentless barrage that forced Muhammad's army to fall back, struggling to withstand the overwhelming firepower. The deafening explosions and the hail of projectiles created a scene of chaos and destruction, compelling Muhammad to reassess his strategy and rally his forces for a counterattack. As the battle spills beyond the walls of the fortress, Muhammad re-enters the fray, cutting a path through his foes with swift and decisive strikes. Amidst the chaos of the battlefield, he comes face to face with Achuthan, and the two engage in a fierce and intense sword fight. Despite emerging victorious, Muhammad spares Achuthan's life, recognizing the importance of allowing him to fulfill his duty in performing his father's last rites. In a moment of hesitation, as Muhammad extends this mercy, a sudden shot rings out and he crumples to the ground, sending shockwaves through his comrades and friends. When he awakens, Muhammad Muhammad is glad he is alive as he can take revenge on all that conspired against him. As he takes up his quest, it begins to create unrest amongst the noblemen, fearing for their lives. To fix this issue, Dagama decides that he would execute ten of Muhammad's people for every man he kills until he surrenders. Once the executions begin, Patu is the first one to be killed. When Muhammad finds out what is happening, he sneaks into the palace and kidnaps Dagama. Trust the wife of an old comrade, Zubaida. He asked her to take a message to the king, letting them know that he would release the general if his people were freed, but she betrays him by telling Achuthan. Achuthan sets up an ambush and manages to capture Muhammad. After he is taken to court for his crimes, Muhammad is sentenced to death after pridefully announcing that he would not beg for forgiveness. After making his last prayer, he watches the giant blade come upon him, ending his life. And with that, the movie ends. We hope you enjoyed our video. Watch the next recaps on the screen and don't forget to subscribe for more amazing recaps. See you in the next one.